All right, here we have a two-parter. Firstly, thank you so much for what you're doing, sir. You and Nabil have had a real, really great impact on my life. Question, what is eternal sin? Mark 329, how do you sin against the Holy Spirit? Or two, why should we accept the Bible as our moral standard? What makes it unique? Um, let me go ahead and read the verses and resident theologian, you can uh, take a take Oh, a you're setting me up for a full Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, in Mark 3, uh, starting at verse 28, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And the reason it's important, I get, I get messages fairly regularly of someone saying, hey, I blasphemed God or something like that. Can I even be forgiven? So, what do you think? Yeah, so this is something I looked at myself a while ago, so I can see why people are concerned about this. Just to respond to that briefly, people why they blasphemed against God. Actually, we see in the scripture that people, you know, blaspheme against Christ, they reject Christ, they turn against God, yet they still come to faith. So we know that blasphemy against God itself doesn't keep someone from coming to Christ. So if you're watching, I would encourage you, don't let that hold you back. Do come to Christ. In terms of what is being about, spoken about here, you have to bear in mind what the Holy Spirit does in Scripture. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit, which we see in the New Testament, is to convict people of their sin. What I think is going on, uh, I didn't make this up, a lot of other people believe in this explanation, is that because the role of the Holy Spirit is to convict people of sin, Resisting the Holy Spirit, that is blasphemy, and the reason why that results in why that is an eternal sin is because if you don't allow the Holy Spirit to convict you of sin because you resist him, you can never come to Christ. If you can never come to Christ, you can never have your sins forgiven. So that is why it is an eternal sin. Now, back in this time period, um, the opponents of Jesus, they were faced with clearer evidence of who Jesus was than perhaps we are faced today. Therefore, they were even more guilty when they rejected that. So some do actually say this um, sin against the Holy Spirit can't be done today. Um, but I would say at least in some parts it can be when we continually resist the Holy Spirit throughout our lives. So if you're worried about committing it, don't worry, but come to Christ. Yes, if, yeah. if you're worried about committing it, you're not the sort of person who Precisely. has committed it. Yeah, Precisely. You're not, you're, your conscience isn't that, uh, isn't that seared. Exactly. Uh, the, the, the second part, why should we accept the Bible as our moral standard? What makes it unique. Um, I mean, if you think about the, the possible um, sources of our moral beliefs, we believe certain things are, are right and wrong. Um, it, if you take like an atheistic perspective, there are only a couple places you're getting your, um, your, your moral claims from. You could be hardwired to believe certain things. Uh, that wouldn't be objective. I mean, some people are hardwired to, to be more violent, right? They're just, they, they have urges to be violent, just the way some people have an urge to you know live in peace with other people. So being hardwired doesn't make something right or wrong. Um, and the, the other source would be you know your community or your culture raises you to believe certain things. But uh, I mean there there are cultures in the world where if you walk if a woman walks down the street without a male escort, um, her family will think they have a moral obligation to beat her to death or to or, or to uh, you know slit her throat or something. Um, we would look at that and say that's 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 awful. That's horrible. But if morality is just what your culture teaches, then then that would be good in their culture, would it not? And so you need something, you need something else. So the question is, why should we take um, what God has revealed in Scripture as our source of authority? And the, the, the there, there are multiple answers for this, but the, the, the quickest one that I would offer is, we know that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, we know this, we know this historically. And so if Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, then if anyone in history has God's stamp of approval on his message, it would be Jesus. And so if we're asking ourselves, how should we live, then we know someone has God's stamp of approval on his message. That's Jesus. How does Jesus command us to live? And I don't even know why people would object to the core principles that Jesus taught about morality. He said, uh, he was asked, what are the greatest commandments? Uh, he said, love the, Lord your, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and, and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Why I would mean, you object? I, I you indeed. love God and you love, you love others. And then along those same lines, I mean, the core foundational principle 
is do unto others, according to Jesus, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, should I steal? No, I wouldn't want people doing that to me, so why would I do it to others? So I have no idea why people would object to this, but when we add to this the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and has uh, clearly God's stamp of approval, I would say, if we're going to listen to anyone, we should listen to him. Other than that, there's no one to listen to, and it's just uh, opinion or culture or the way you the way you feel, and those are, just aren't good sources of morality. Do you want to add something? Yeah. So I would say that the kind of person who's asking this, maybe the atheist out there, the agnostic, they may not realize that actually the ethical code which they would typically live by is perhaps a byproduct of a Christian society, oh, a yeah. former Christian society. The person asking is perhaps already living on borrowed ethical capital yeah. in the first place. And, and so the, the idea there is if the average atheist today looks at his moral beliefs, if he sat down and, and wrote down what he believes is right and wrong, if he were to go say 2,000 years earlier before the spread of Christianity, the average person would have given some very, very different oh, lanes. Infanticide, for example. Yeah. Infanticide in the Roman world just wasn't a big deal. Yeah. I'm not talking about abortion. You've had a yeah. child, the child is outside of the womb. You decide you don't want it, um, maybe you can't be bothered, maybe it's female, so you just leave it in the street to die. You have completely different views of, of violence towards other people. I mean, the, their favorite spectacle during the time of the Romans were the, uh, the, the, the gladiatorial uh, contests where people would get there and just rip each other apart and they would have animals rip people apart and your average atheist today would be horrified at this. Guess what? This was their favorite thing to watch in the Roman Empire. Now, human nature didn't change. What changed? Well, something changed people's views and what changed people's views was uh, the spread of the message of Jesus. And so atheists who are you know, clinging to their own moral views um, need to understand where those ultimately come from, and they don't ultimately come from atheism.